Before we go into our singing portion of the service, I do have the honor of uh, bringing attention to one of the church's patriarchs. Uh, the Lord gave us this church, but he used the leadership and humility of a man sitting right over here, who I uh, affectionately call dad, um, because he's my spiritual dad. He's, uh, uh, he's got a brilliant mind. Uh, he's got, he's, his teaching is second to none, and uh, we've been blessed to, to really have his uh, ministry in our lives. I, we, we like to bring your attention to him because he's not here every Sunday. He's, he, he used to be able to, when he was younger, he used to be able to pull double duty. He'd be here preparing for, for worship and, and teaching, and he would go out to the prison all week long and do ministry out there as the chaplain out there. Uh, but but uh, it wasn't too long ago that uh, the Lord told him that's, that's enough. Uh, and he, he uh, got his attention through a, through a heart attack. And uh, as a result, uh, he's now devoting his time out there. We support him out there as a church. And we'd like to uh, bring his face in front of you guys so that you know where that uh, support is going. Uh, we'd like to hear from him uh, how things are going out there. So, uh, Pastor Briggs, if you have... A few words to say. You can stand right there by the microphone. That's fine. I think you you wanted to just say thank you. I, I hold this thing over there. No, you, you don't have to hold it. Just just go ahead and talk. It'll it'll get you. Yeah. Well, the patriarch part is pretty accurate. Thank you, Jose. Uh, it is uh, our privilege to uh, for you to keep us inside prison, uh, not in state prison. Uh, we love it there because the Lord's called us there. Uh, possible. Uh, our daughter Val is on her way in a couple hours to the homeless uh, in South Springs, and you support that as well. Uh, I know about four boxes of stuff from the prison yesterday. Uh, the prisoners donated stuff and <coughs> donated stuff, uh, which is probably not legal, but uh, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, prison stuff is legal. But uh, anyhow, uh, you all made that possible. Uh, we're having the time of our lives out there. And uh, I haven't invited you lately, but if anybody would like to come in, every 21 year old, there's no problem. Uh, come inside with us and look around. Uh, we can relatively guarantee you coming out. Not totally, but uh, uh, so far, so good. And uh, we would love to have anybody who wanted to visit, look around, meet the guys. And uh, again, we can't thank everybody enough to uh, uh, allow us, uh, support us to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. And uh, for those of you that don't know, our, our uh, website has a link to uh, many of the uh, artifacts that went along with uh, Pastor Briggs' uh, messages and topics. Uh, it's still just as powerful today as it was, you know, 30 years ago when he put it together. So uh, I, I, I invite you to check out uh, that those artifacts in the uh, in the website. I don't think uh, you could get through that stuff. Uh, it'd take you years to get through it, but it's well worth it. And uh, any topic just about that you want to look at, you can find his uh, his teachings on that there. All right, so um, we're going to do things a little bit different this morning. So rather than just jumping right into song, uh, I want to start with the Lord's Supper. Because in, in, in uh, Matthew, we read that uh, they had the, taken of the Lord's Supper, and then they sang hymns. So we're going to do that. Uh, I'd like to ask Joseph and Samuel to please come on up and help me with this. So Samuel and, and Joseph, for those of you who don't know, are my sons. And it's my honor to have my sons coming up here and participating with me in leading us in the Lord's Supper. Uh, in the men's meeting this morning, um, we were talking about the topic of unity. Uh, we find in God's Word that unity is not something that, that He would like, or something that He would hope for, or something that He wishes that we would do, that we would be more unified. Uh, we find, it, as a matter of fact, that it's actually um, something that is... Um, it is uh, um, it's the word I'm looking for um, it is essential it is an absolute requirement it's not uh, I wish you guys would be more unified 
It is, you, you, I'm going to make you one. I'm going to make you one. One in the Spirit. Um, he only deals in one. Uh, one God, one Spirit, one Father, one faith, one way, one truth, one life. <clears throat> it's not something that... Oh, I'm sorry, and then let's not forget one body. Um, but it is a, an ordained fact. These things are an ordained fact. So let's keep that in mind. When we sing songs like we are one in the Spirit, it, it is a testimony. The, the fact that we are one is a true mark of the Church of Christ. I don't know about you, but I, I certainly want to be part of the true Church of Christ. And we know that we are true Church of Christ if we are one. So let's, let's continue to, to keep that in mind. As part of one church, one faith, we have this one communion service that the Lord himself has given us. And he gave it to us to remember his death. First Corinthians chapter 11, verses 25 through 26. After the same manner also, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. So uh, for today's communion service, I bring to remembrance that we are not saved by the resurrection of our Lord, but by his death. The word of God says that it is by his death he would destroy the death and that he and he that had the power of death. So Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. For as much then as as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, and that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In Romans chapter 6, We take, we take a look at how his death makes us holy. Beginning with verse 3. So Paul had just gotten through, uh, at the end of verse uh, chapter 5, uh, he's just gotten through explaining to, to, the, um, to the church that we should continue, or I'm sorry, explaining that to say that we should continue in sin so that grace would abound would be absurd. And to say that... Uh, And to say that would be not to know God. He then goes back to remind us that we are new creatures born of God's Spirit. And he says in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 11, Know ye not that so many of us that were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like Christ was raised up from the dead, the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. This is describing being born again. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve that we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death had no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, 
but a life unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we are baptized into his death. We too see we too see death as necessary so that, like him, we can be raised into a new being that is born of the Spirit of God. We are born again. And then you find that when he's speaking to Nicodemus, he said, you must be born again. Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said this unto thee. Unto thee. Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst tell whence it cometh, and whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Joseph and uh, uh, Samuel, please uh, pass the elements of the bread. that you would make preparations in your heart to partake in the sacraments. Thinking about the death of Christ is not an easy thing. I don't think it was intended to be easy. I think it's, we should thank him that it never fails to have the impact it's supposed to have in our lives. Through his death, by the means of his death, we are reminded of the, the terribleness of sin, the consequence of sin. This was the only way that we could be saved. And for anyone to think that there's another way to be saved or it could be through works makes mockery of what Jesus had to endure. If there was another way, why didn't he do it? This is the only way. It was by his death. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This, is, this do in remembrance of me. Uh, Joseph, would you please... Bless the element of the bread. Lord, I thank you for this day you've given us and for everything you bless us with, for allowing us to come together and to remember your death, death of your son. I pray that you would keep that always in our mind, Father, that we'd remember how much uh, you paid for us, Father. We are slaves to you, to you alone. So I pray now that you'll bless this bread and that you'll bless the rest of this day to your glory. I pray this in your son's name. Yes. Amen. Church for take. body um, certainly bore the marks for us um, the passion that he endured is uh, well recorded and most physicians would look at it and say 
uh, marvel at the fact that a man was even able to stand after the beatings that he took and to, to continue all the way up to the cross in the condition that he was in. But it's through the blood. Without the shedding of blood, the Word of God says, there is no remission for sin. It's the blood that makes us white as snow. It's the blood that covers our sins. And it does such a good job of its intended purpose that when the Lord God himself looks on us who have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, he sees only the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. He doesn't see our past sins. He doesn't see any of that. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He sees his son. And that's what the blood did for us. So, praise be to God. And certainly, uh, we are in awe of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we are asked to partake of it. Sammy, would you please ask a blessing on the element? Yes. Heavenly Father, we want to come before you today and thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us and for the victory over death that you gave us, Lord. We want to pray that you'll bless this strength into our bodies, Lord, and help us to remember throughout our entire life and help us to incorporate our beliefs into everything that we do, Lord. And help us to remember this, the sacrifice and the love that you had for us. I pray that you'll just bless this strength and help us to always remember it. I ask all this in your son's name. Amen. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he, when he had sup, saying, The cup, or this cup, is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. I invite you to partake. they partook in that supper, they sang hymns. So I'd like to invite you to turn to 551 in your hymnal. We're going to sing soon and very soon. Please stand with me.
gonna play an original piece that was actually inspired by that song called Flight. Thank you. 
Thank you, Joseph. That was great. It's hard to preach after he plays. <laughs> Anyway, <clears throat> uh, I'd like us to stand for the reading of God's Word, please. <coughs> Turn to Romans chapter 1. I'll read and you, follow, you can follow along. I'll read eight, verses 18 to <clears throat> 23. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world as invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Thank you. You sit down. Father, please uh, open our eyes and our hearts to your word this morning. Show us uh, more clearly the times we are living in and what we are experiencing in our nation, our society, our culture. And we pray, Lord, that we would stand out um, as Christians, that we would be able to herald the truth in the midst of a lost generation. And we pray that you bless your word by the Spirit of God. And we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. Thank you. America is and has been for some time undergoing an amazing and escalating moral revolution. But we can't discuss the moral revolution without coupling it with what led to it, which is the secularization of America. Whenever you have a moral revolution in any society, it always begins with the secularizing of that society. And in our case here in America, this secularizing is continuing at an alarming rate. Even a decade ago, Psychology Today stated, quote, today secularization appears to be running rampant Indeed, the world contains fewer religious people and more secular people than ever before in recorded human history. All we have to do is turn on the news to see the secularization of our society unfolding before our very eyes. The rise of the feminist movement within the last 100 plus years. The dismantling of marriage and the family over the last 60 years. The public shamelessness of pornography since the early 70s, the acceptance of abortion on demand in all 50 states since 1973, the rise of out of wedlock births along with wholesale no fault divorce since the 60s and 70s, the cultural acceptance of homosexuality and the legalization of same sex marriage in the early 2000s. The recent recognition and public acceptance of transgenderism and traditional gender identity. 
along with the current politicization of social justice, violent crime, cancel culture, critical race theory, the weakening and feminization of our military, and a host of other godless shifts in our nation, which are just a few of the results of secularization in America. But what is secularization? Well, the term refers generally to the decline of religion and its influence on a particular society. It's the historical process by which religion weakens, lessens, diminishes, or fades away in a society. It entails a social process in which fewer people over time believe in supernatural claims. Fewer people engage in religious activities and fewer people belong to or identify with a particular religion. But secularization here in America is a bit narrower than these definitions. Secularization here refers to the decline, not of religion in general, but specifically the decline of Christianity in its influence on our culture. D.A. Hollinger said 20 years ago, our discussion of secularization would be sharpened if in many contexts we employed the term de-Christianization instead. But when we say the secularization is the de-Christianization of America, we don't mean Christianity is declining in America. Rather, it means Christianity is becoming less effective in America. Better said, Christianity is significantly losing its influence because more and more churches and more and more Christians are becoming less influential, less influential for Christ in our society. There, are, there may be as, as many churches and professing Christians as there, have, as there has ever been in America today, but we are surrendering to our secular culture rather than turning it to Christ. So this morning I want to begin looking at the secularization of America and how it has fueled our rapid moral decline. And uh, this will be the first of, I don't know how many messages, Terry, Terry will tell me when to shut up. <laughs> but um, Keep going, brother. <laughs> We'll be looking here at Romans 1, where the Apostle Paul describes for us God's wrath revealed against a society because of its secularization. And in this passage, the Apostle is specifically describing his own Greco-Roman society's secularization and its moral collapse. But what he describes here is not just his own society, but any society's secularization. And as we go through these verses, I want us to see why and how God reveals his wrath against such a society. So we'll begin with, first, the reasons for God's wrath against the society. The reasons why God reveals his wrath from, from heaven, from any uh, against any society or culture or nation. And in verses 18 to 23, the verses I just read to you, we see two reasons why God reveals his wrath against the secularized society. Number one, it's because that society suppresses the truth about God. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. They suppress the truth. Paul is very clear that God reveals his wrath against a society characterized by ungodly and unrighteous people who suppress 
the truth. Now, we can attest to the fact that our nation has moved away from being primarily a God-fearing society or a God-fearing nation to a godless nation. Even though from our inception, many of our people were not Christians. They weren't, many weren't Christians, but we still, we still had a respect for Christianity. Nevertheless, our nation was established on Christian principles, even though the entire nation and all the people in it were not Christian. Our justice system was patterned after a divine biblical model. Our politicians were respectful and agreeable to the Judeo-Christian ethic and principles, even if they themselves weren't Christian. From the beginning, our states enacted what we call blue laws, or laws restricting non-religious activities on Sundays for the sake of Christian worship. And we see even today a remnant of our country's reverence and respect for religious principles as many of our car dealerships and our liquor stores are closed, at least liquor stores until noon, respecting the blue laws. Um, but even in spite of this, our nation, by and large, has given up any notion of God and His authority. During the last 60 years, in the process of secularization, we have erased God from our society in almost every institution and every way of life. Our government, our schools, our workplaces, our society. Well, why is that? Why, why have we erased God, basically erased God as a nation? Well, Paul tells us here, it's because we suppress the truth. We have suppressed the truth about God. And once a society suppresses the truth about God, it begins a rapidly increasing spiral into the moral abyss. And this is exactly what we're seeing in our country today. But specifically, what truth does Paul say a society suppresses to bring about God's wrath against it? <clears throat> well, it's in, stated in the next verse, verse 19. What may be known of God? That's what a nation suppresses. What may be known of God? You know, this tells us that each one of us knows the truth about God. Saved or unsaved makes no difference. But because of our sinful condition, we all suppress the truth about God to one degree or another. And what we learn here is what can be known of God is divinely given to each of us at birth both internally by divine revelation to the soul and externally in divine revelation through creation. Notice in verse 20 that this external knowledge is clearly seen through our human senses, particularly the sense of sight. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. This is by every single person. You know, there's real, no one is born an atheist into this world. Every person is born with an innate knowledge that God exists and an innate knowledge of what God is like. His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood, not only seen, but understood by the things that God has made. Even His eternal power and Godhead. You know, every person since Adam and Eve has clearly seen and understood through God's creation these three attributes. These three divine attributes. <clears throat> Each one of us, purely from God's revelation and creation, and what He has placed in our hearts, <laughs> without a Bible, no, we all know that He is eternal, He is all-powerful, and He is divine. 
He's not like us. Yes. Amen. Yes. This is what we all know coming into this world. And what happens is we have to suppress that truth to get away from Him. And that's what we do. That's what men do. But why has God revealed this knowledge to us? Why, did, why is it that He has put into our hearts a knowledge of Himself? Why has He put in creation a knowledge of Himself so every person can rationally understand that not only He exists, but what He's like? Well, one simple reason. Look at the end of verse 20. So that they are without excuse. That's why God reveals Himself to every human being. So that in the day of judgment, no person can say, God, I didn't know you existed. God, I didn't know what you were like. Every person's mouth will be stopped in that day because they know that He is and what He is like. But Paul gives us another reason why God reveals His wrath against a, sec a secular society. Um, <clears throat> number two, it's because that society refuses to give Him glory or thanks. That's in verses 21 to 23 that I've already read. The society refuses to give him glory or thanks. In these verses, Paul describes what a society does when it suppresses the truth about God. It refuses to glorify him and thank him. You say, give him glory and thanks for what? Well, see, that's the problem. <laughs> We should all know that we need to give God glory and thanks just for waking up in the morning. That's right. That's right, brother. And as Tim knows, as hard as it is to get out of bed in the morning, he's thankful that he can do it and go to work. So he every day gives God glory and thanks for that. But you know what? A lot of people don't. They don't give him glory and thanks. And that's the reason God's reveal, revealing His wrath against the society. I mean, just for our existence, for our sustenance. <clears throat> so we can enjoy creation, everything He's given us. But how does the so society get to that point? Why does the society not give God the glory and thanks He deserves? All you have to do is look at this fourfold progression, or what I would call a regression. Yes. Number one, in verse 21, it's people become futile in their thoughts. Number two, it's people become darkened in their hearts. Number three, it's people become foolish in their wisdom. And number four, it's people become idolatrous in their worship. That's why the society doesn't give glory, glory or thanks to God. In other words, when a society is not satisfied with the truth about God and it rejects that truth, that society eventually, eventually and inevitably chases after something it believes to be more satisfying than God. It looks for a replacement. And that replacement is idolatry. Yes. Yes. Verse 21 tells us men become futile in their thinking. You see that? Although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts. This means their natural ability to reason accurately about God is progressively damaged because of their suppression of the truth. And in many cases, that ability to reason is damaged so severely that it becomes impossible to return to any sense of a true knowledge of God. This downward spiral into sin that renders a person's reasoning void 
in the moral realm. And this is why you can have extremely educated people, extremely intellectual people that can create great technology and all kinds of things, but they don't have a clue about God. They're, they're morally bankrupt. They become futile in their thinking in the moral realm. That's what Paul's describing. And when this happens in enough people, or in so many people controlling the narrative of a society, like today, with the media or the government, it damages and even destroys a nation's moral compass to the point that it can no longer know right from wrong. Because it suppresses the truth about God. And as Isaiah 5.20 says, it even replaces right with wrong. And that nation insane, insanely begins to call evil good and good evil, and that's exactly what's happening in our country. It begins to substitute darkness for light and light light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter in the moral realm. This is exactly what is happening in our country, not only with people in general, but specifically with our legislatures and courts, politics, media, corporations, entertainment, education, and the list goes on and on. But the more foolish a nation becomes, the wiser it thinks it is. You see that in verse 22? Professing to be wise, they became fools. I mean, this is the height of insanity. Yes. But we're seeing it everywhere. I mean, we can't even keep up with the insanity. So, yeah. The prouder and more arrogant and debauched and stupid our political and social leaders become in relation to morality and common sense, the wiser they think they are. And an example of this is just in the last couple of weeks. We're actually putting on the Supreme Court someone who refuses to define what a woman is strictly for political purposes in order to advance a transgender and gender, gender identity agenda in our country. And it's not just for a few weeks or for a few months, it's for life. Professing to be fools, they become, professing to be wise, they become fools. That's right. I mean, how much more foolish could we have witnessed something this past week? Yes. Well, this is how secularization works. And, it's, and what it does to a nation or a culture or society. I mean, this is really pretty easy to preach on. I mean, we're seeing it right in front of our very eyes. All we got to do is point it out. I mean, this is nothing more than idolatry in verse 23. The society changes the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Basically, it's the worship of the creature, of the creature rather than a creator. If you go down to verse 25 and take a peek, this is the lie. Idolatry is the lie. And when you believe the lie, you exchange the truth about God for idolatry. And of course, this is Satan's lie, isn't it? Yes. The same lie he perpetrated in the garden on Adam and Eve, it's the exact same lie. So Satan, the master deceiver that he is, not only creates doubt about divine truth in individuals, he does it collectively in whole societies. And eventually, after he convinced convinces individuals and whole societies to abandon God, 
Sin becomes better than righteousness. Disobedience becomes better than obedience. And worshiping idols becomes better than worshiping God. Especially because those idols are of a society's own making. Instead of worshiping the true God, which conscience and nature demand, a society turns to worshiping everything but God. It goes from true worship to idolatry, from divine prescription to human invention. Now, men will always worship something. We are created worshiping beings. They will either worship a true God, the true God or a false God. The drive to worship is placed within the hearts of all each one of us from God our Creator, according to Ecclesiastes 3.11. But the entrance of sin has corrupted man's desire and ability to worship the true God so badly that this desire is always directed toward false worship or false gods. For the Greeks and Romans in Paul's day, they worshipped the gods of Egypt and the Orient. For birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. In our day, we worship current pop stars, political figures, sports figures, sometimes even religious figures, along with money, sex, drugs, position, power, and an endless list of other items. But all of these things originate in God's good creation. But men turn them into detestable objects of worship. So from God's original design and intention for men to worship Him, worship has been turned completely on its head in our society. Instead of worshiping and serving the Creator, it worships and serves the creation at every turn. And this is precisely why God reveals His wrath against the society. Because, because although it knew Him, as our nation once did, it has abandoned and even replaced Him. <clears throat> so these are the specific reasons. But how does God exercises wrath against the society. We've already established that he does, but how does he do that? Well, that brings us to second, the manifestations of God's wrath against the society. Let me just go ahead and read these <clears throat> from verses 24 and following. <clears throat> Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burn in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. There are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. If Paul were here today, I don't think you'd see him on CNN. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> 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 
He now describes for us how God manifests his wrath against any society that by and large abandons God. And this is extremely simple to understand. If you get anything out of the message this morning, this is the one thing you need to get. Whenever a society abandons God, God abandons the society. And in these verses, Paul tells us three times, three times how God abandons the society. Look at verse 24. God gave them up. Look at verse 26. God gave them up. Verse 28. God gave them over. Or He gave them up. It's the same word. When a society or nation gives God up, He gives it up. This giving up or giving over is the word paradidomy. It means to hand over or to give up to justice. When a society or nation forsakes God, God hands it over to His divine justice. The justice it deserves. And what is that justice? And this is the second thing I want you to get. God's justice on a secular society is His allowing of that society to fall further and further into its sin so it becomes more without excuse, more guilty before Him, and more deserving of His wrath in the day of judgment. That's what His justice is. I mean, Paul even describes this building up of God's wrath against sinners in chapter 2. Look at it with me in verses 5 and 6, where he says in a slightly different context, but in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. So right now, God's wrath is passive against a society or a nation. As that society or nation piles up more and more guilt for the day of judgment because of its sin and rejection of God. But when that day comes, God's wrath will become active. And then He will destroy both soul and body in hell. That's what Jesus said. But now I want us to see how God progressively reveals His wrath against a society. Let's get a little bit more specific here. Number one, God first gives that society up to heterosexual immorality. He gives that society up to heterosexual immorality in verses 24 and 25. Paul has already said in verse 18 that because a society suppresses the truth about God, and refuses to give God glory and thanks in verses 21 to 23, he then gives that society up to the sin of sexual immorality between men and women. That's the first step in God revealing his wrath against a society. He gives it up to heterosexual immorality. Sex between men and women outside of marriage. Hasn't that, been, hasn't that been the case in our country? Now, we're not naive. I mean, this kind of sexual immorality has always existed in America. I mean, since day one. But generally speaking, up until 60 or 70 years ago, we as a nation did not openly tolerate that sexual immorality. But when the sexual revolution gained traction in the second half of the 20th century, immorality began to be more openly accepted and promoted as the new moral order. But it doesn't stop there. 
when this sin continues in a society without restraint. Number two, God gives that society up to homosexual immorality in verses 26 and 27. Once you have heterosexual immorality running rampant and culturally accepted and promoted, not only by individuals, but by the society as a whole, the next step is that society going headlong into the moral sewer. and escalation in public acceptance of homosexuality. And that's exactly been the progression in our country since the 60s. And that's why Paul says God gave them, that means the society or the culture or the nation, up for a second time. He says, for this reason, in verse 26, for what reason? Well, it's for the reason of unrestrained, unrestrained heterosexual activity outside of marriage. When that happens, God gives up that society to homosexuality. And in these verses, Paul describes both female and male homosexuality. And it works like this. And we now see in our own country, our country is a textbook case on what Paul has described here. When a nation's sexual revolution of immoral heterosexual activity grows to the point of cultural acceptance and promotion as the norm God's wrath boils over to the point of him giving that society over to an even greater perversion, which is homosexuality. And what we need to understand here is that even though sex between men and women outside of marriage is an abomination to God, it's still natural sex. But homosexual sin is always unnatural and deviant and is always a greater abomination to God. That's what he says in verse 27. The men leaving the natural use of the woman. Men with men committing what is shameful. But did, did you notice in these verses, Paul begins in verse 26 with lesbianism? Sex between women? Now, one of the reasons for this may be because of the two God-created sexes, male and female, which seems to be debated today. Women are the least likely to fall into this appalling sin, making it even more of an abomination to God. And we can deduce from this regression of going from heterosexual activity into homosexual activity that neither one is ever satisfied. I was going to say, trying to help you answer that question, we as men need to quit us as men and love our wives. And if we don't do that, they're going to go look for it someplace else. Amen. That's scripture. Very true. Very true. Once a man or woman starts down this path, the desire for these sins, apart from God's grace, can never be quenched. It can only increase. Sexual sin always leads to more sexual sin and then to deviant sexual sin. Like a drug, there has to be more of a high from these sins the next time than there was the previous time. But by God's creational design, according to the Bible, sex is always to be within marriage. But more than that, within a marriage between a man and a woman. Pretty sad that I have to say that, right? But even more than that, between a biological man and a biological woman. 
Which is even sadder to say. I mean, really, five years ago, I wouldn't have had to say that. And when a society or culture or nation jettisons God, God's design for sex and marriage, this is the result. In future messages, we'll look in more detail at how the moral or sexual revolution in our country is completely dismantled. The God-ordained, God-created design and identity of male and female as well as marriage. But this is exactly what's happening in our country and as believers we need to know what's going on. We need to understand it through the prism of Scripture. And frankly, without Romans 1, we'd have a difficult time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, Romans 1 is our compass through what we're going through today as a nation. So the unrestrained, immoral, heterosexual activity of the last decades of the 20th century gave way to the increasingly accepted and social promotion of homosexuality in the early 2000s, just as Paul saw it in his own day. But it doesn't stop there. There's one more step in how God removed his wrath against a society. So number three, God gives that society up to a debased mind in verses 28 to 31. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. Paul says in these verses that in a morally downward, spiraling society, God gives that society up for a third time. Even as they, they who? They, the society, the culture, the nation. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge by suppressing the truth about Him, as He stated in the beginning in verse 18, God gives that society over to a debased mind or a reprobate mind. Some of your translations might have been. This is a mind completely devoid of a moral compass. This is a mind that advocates immoral, abnormal sex as not only acceptable, but normal. This is the debased mind that cancels you if you don't get on board with the ever-changing, ever-escalating moral revolution. I mean, this is a mind devoid of all moral restraint. I mean, isn't this the condition of our country? When we look around and see all the sexual proclivity and sexual devi deviancy imaginable, we could never have imagined these things just a decade ago. And now we think, how much worse can it get? I mean, every time I turn on the news, I say, certainly, this has got to be it. But it's going to get worse. Trust the Bible. It's going to get a lot worse. And we need to be ready for it. Many of us think homosexuality is the end of the line. We think it's the worst sin. It's not. Look at the list of sins in verses 29 to 31. Did you notice that that's in the third phase of God's wrath? That follows the second phase of God's wrath against homosexuality. So homosexuality can't be the worst sin. After God gives a society over to the grossest sexual moralities, He then gives it over to, and you need to get this, every kind of sin. Or as Paul says in verse 29, filled with every kind of sin. You 
In the days ahead, we'll see sexual deviancy from God's created order continue and even shock us with things we could never dream of. That's guaranteed. But we will see many other sins becoming normalized and legitimized in our country. That's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about acceptance and legitimacy in a society. Something we've never seen before in our society. But it's coming. And we've even gotten a taste of it. Sins that were criminalized before are going to be legitimized. And I believe, based on this text, we are entering into the third stage of God's wrath against our nation. I have no doubt about it. Because that's what this says. And in this, state, and in this stage, we will see legislation of even more immoral and deviant practices. Practices like infanticide, euthanasia, bestiality, child's rights over parents' rights, and many more. Have you gone through the list? Those sins are in this list. And they're coming to our nation sooner than we think. So as bad as homosexuality is, let's not think it's the worst the point is, God is furious with every sin in a society. Every sin that a society perpetrates, accepts, and promotes as normal, as self-fulfilling, as true individual freedom. And we need to get this. When a society has reached this final stage in its moral decline and... We're, on, we're at the beginning of this stage in our country right now. When a society has reached its final stage in its moral decline, that society has no hope of recovery. We will not recover from this. There is no societal hope, there's no legislative hope, there's no judicial hope, and there's no political hope because it's all going the wrong direction. Tragically, this is what we're seeing in America today and we're going to continue to see it. And have you noticed? We are not only committing these sins as a nation, at an increasingly alarming rate. Our culture is encouraging people to commit. Yeah. And doesn't this perfectly agree with what Paul says at the end of this chapter? In verse 32? Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, those people not only do the same, but also approve or applaud those who practice them. And today, if you're not all in with the secularization of America, if you as a Christian speak out against these accepted societal sins, you will be shunned, mocked, canceled, and possibly even assaulted and imprisoned. And you'll have no legal recourse. It's happening right now. So Romans 1, 18 to 32 is a picture of a society that abandons God or what we call today a, a secularized society. And frighteningly, it's our society. Well, that's the bad news. Let me give you some good news. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, Paul doesn't begin the discussion at verse 18, does he? He 
begins in verse 16. Go back and look at it with me. And I'm, I'm landing the plane here. I'm kind of getting close to the end. So. <laughs> he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As I just said, there's no hope for a society that, aban that abandons God. No hope whatsoever. You can't fight against God. God has already rendered the judgment. He's passed sentence. And now he's executed. Right. But God be thanked, there is hope for individuals in that society, right? Yeah. Yeah. There is hope, yes. <clears throat> Each one of us here at Sage Creek was part of this society headed for eternal destruction before we came to Christ, right? Mm -hmm. So we know there's hope for individuals. We're living testimony to that. God in His great mercy saved us yes. from the coming destruction. Yes. <clears throat> but He did not save us to isolate ourselves from that society. I don't want to be part of the larger church that has become irrelevant in this society. I'm not going to do it. This is the society we at Sage Creek are called to bring the gospel to. This is the best, I believe this is the best time, at least in our country, to evangelize. I agree, it is. Because there's such a dark, stark contrast between the society and the truth. So yes. There's no ambiguity. If you're here this morning and are part of the secularized America, there's hope for you. In the gospel of Christ. Did you see it in verses 17 and 18? In 18 to 31, God reveals his wrath against sinners for their sin. I just spent too much time telling you about that. But did you notice in 17 and 18 that there are two revelations of God? Did you see that? In verse 18, He reveals His wrath. But in verse 17, He reveals His righteousness. So His wrath is revealed against sinful men and women, but His righteousness is revealed in the Gospel of Christ to those same men and women. Did you know that God demands perfect righteousness to get into heaven? He does. He does. Perfect. From the time you're born till the time you die, you have to be perfect. No slip-ups. You say, Al, oh, that's impossible. Of course it's impossible. I can't get out of bed in the morning without sinning. I mean, we all sin daily. Just by not loving the Lord God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, I've already sinned. We've all put other gods before God. We've all taken His name in vain. We've all gotten angry with people. We've all lusted in our hearts. We've all lied. We've all stolen. We've all coveted the things of others. And these are just the start. As we've seen so clearly this morning, left to ourselves, we've all suppressed the truth about God and we've all refused to give Him glory and honor. We're guilty. But amazing, beyond comprehension, yes. God offers a remedy yes. to each one of us. Yes. 
if you will turn from your ungodliness and unrighteousness. This morning, God will grant you, God will impute to you His perfect righteousness to meet His perfect standard. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord. We don't earn it. We only reach out and take it. You say, well, how can God do that? Well, when you believe and completely trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and His death on a cross to pay for sins, God then takes away your completely deserved judgment and imputes to you Christ's perfect righteousness. It's a perfectly equal trade. Do you need God's perfect righteousness today? To escape his coming wrath. That's the only way you can escape. You gotta be perfect. Well, you can get that perfect righteousness by trusting in Jesus Christ right now. Cry out to God to save you from save you from your sins through the work of Christ at Calvary. And believe that He rose from the dead three days later to give eternal life to everyone who puts their trust in Him. You need to flee from a society that is running headlong into God's eternal condemnation and then flee to Christ and His mercy at Calvary. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts for salvation, let him come unto me and drink. need to come to Christ right now. Father, thank you for this time. And thank you for your word. It's so clear and so, so obvious. I pray, Lord, that we would not retreat. That we wouldn't wave the, right, the white flag. That we would jump at the front of the line, Lord. And grow, go headlong into battle and bring the gospel of Christ to a condemned nation. If there's anyone here, Lord, that needs Christ, I pray that they would surrender today. They would put their trust in Him, confess their sins, and reach out and take the greatest gift that has ever been offered, the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. We pray in His name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're done. Thank you, brother.